hello. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I, look, I, I think there, there's probably there's some really good conversations we can have off the back of, or, or, I guess, what Adam just spoke about. Um, yeah. one, one of the things that I did want to talk specifically with you about, um, and both of us have a, a banking background. Yes. Um, and I'll, I'll be the first one to fess up. And I'm, I'm not... I'm not having you go to any particular bank here. I'm talking about the banker, and I was the banker. Um, I, I know for a fact that I used to target broker customers. Um, and I used to target broker customers because I honestly believed that I could look after broker customers better than a broker could. Um, that, that was my belief. And that you could, this is a long time ago. Please don't have a go at me. Uh, don't spit on me in the street or something. <laughs> but... And, and like you know, I used, to, I used to have all these little ways of justifying how to approach them. Like one, one of the things that I used to do is after a broker deal settled, I used to call the customer um, in the first month, and I had I'd actually created scripting for people to use on how to take the glory for what the broker did. So it was a case of you know, hi, Mrs. Mr. Jones, I'm so glad you uh, refinanced your loan with ABC Bank. Um, I can see that we've been able to save you a fair bit of money. Isn't that fantastic that we've been able to save that? If there's anything else you ever need, then please get back in contact with us. Um, and used to try to take, take, I guess, the take the relationship from the broker as soon as I possibly could, understanding that next time they had a need, I wanted them to contact me. Um, now I'm not saying I'm not, as I said, I'm not pointing at any particular bank, only because I don't want to be silenced. <laughs> but when I was a banker. Um, it is it is how I thought, and I think it is a reality um, of, I guess, you know, your your, your customers um, are also taken care of by an, another party as well. Just what was what was your experience? I know you came out of banking um, prior to being a broker. How did you view broker customers? I'm just curious to know. <laughs> uh, look, we not not great. <laughs> Um, it's interesting being on the other side of the fence now when I'm trying to defend my database from the very person I once was. But you're correct, in, in banking world, um, there's absolutely channel conflict. Um, and I came from a bank, which I won't name, but a bank that actually advocates that there is no channel conflict. Um, but absolutely in our back of house room, on our target board, there was a specific target for taking a broker client and bringing them back in house. So, um, you know, it, it, there's definitely it, it's an easy win for the bank because the revenue is higher. They've done no work to initiate the client, but then they bring in the full the full um, profit from it. So, absolutely, brokers or bankers are trained to poach broker clients back. Yeah, it, it's hard because I wouldn't say any bank is out there saying to their bankers still broker customers. But what they do do is say, well, here's your target. And if a broker customer goes from one book um, onto your book, and then we'll incentivize you for it. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not like they're, they're actually out to get your customers. But any clever salesperson will find a way to, to spin that. Um, and I, I remember having a number of conversations where I'll get a phone call saying a broker's complaining about you pinching their customer. And I was like, but the customer wanted to deal with us. And, mm -hmm. and I was right because I was able to have that conversation and convince the customer to do so. Um, and the reality is, and, and this is, I'm not just trying to justify what I'm doing. I'm saying this is what as, a, as brokers we need to think about. The reality is many times the customer hadn't made a welcome call they hadn't made sure that their direct debit had been set up correctly. They hadn't had a sales call after to say, yes, isn't it great that now you're, you know, you, you've been able to get your dream home or whatever else. There was no settlement gift. They, mm -hmm. they, weren't, they weren't calling them just before the fixed rate expired. Or the other classic move I used to do is um, when customers used to come in with a split loan because they used to, you know, they, they probably had a construction loan at some stage. And I was like, oh, look, why don't I just combine these two loans for you and just give you one repayment? Um, and they go, yeah, sure. Little do they know what I'm actually doing is refinancing financing off one book and onto my own. Um, it's it's the, all those little things that banks do well that actually brokers end up losing their customers. And I know this is controversial. I think banks are within their right to do so. If the customer isn't 
if you're not, as a broker, not in constant contact with your customer um, and banks actually see your customer as their customer, you're just the introducer, of course they're going to try to steal that customer. Um, I guess for yourself, Jenna, when, when you got out of banking and, and you've been in a few different roles um, and you know, built some very successful businesses, what were some of those small things that you started to do to say, well, actually, how do I compete with Jenna the banker um, to make sure that my customers stay with me? What's some of those little things that you started doing to keep your customers? I think it's I think it's around what you spoke about, around you truly believed that you were doing the right thing by the client. Mm-hmm. So the mentality in the bank was, well, this broker doesn't contact them. They just set them up on the loan and everything that we dealt with in the bank was, I don't know when my direct debit's coming out. The amount of times we'd see direct debits not go through because they didn't know. So then they're in arrears straight away and they're, you know, distressed because I didn't want to not pay my mortgage. I didn't know what was happening. So for me, when I came out of banking, it was about making sure that I wasn't that broker that just left the client with a home loan that they didn't know what they were doing. So we started to create the process around maintaining contact and I think it, you know, they're really simple things. And, you know, in this time when we're all a little bit uncertain, we're fighting against refi rebates, we're fighting retention teams. I think it's important for us to all just breathe for a second, not try and reinvent the wheel and just stick to the basics. Do what we do well, which is client relationships. Make sure you're adding value to the transaction. Make sure you're checking in at settlement. Make sure the first payment's gone through. But then don't stop there because then, you know, I've seen a lot of new brokers that will go, all right, so we're going to do this, but then they don't check in at six months. Then they don't check in in a year. Then they maybe might do the two-year one and then they drop off. And that's probably the worst time to drop off because that's when we we really want to start talking about the rates. You know, Adam mentioned it earlier. Existing clients have much higher rates than new to bank. Um, You know, it's, it's common practice. So, you, you need to keep the customer for life. The bank have the same mentality in their retention team. It's far cheaper to retain that client than introduce a new client into your business. So we need to look after and nurture what we've got. Yeah, it's, it, look, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, what's, what's some of the things that you've done that I guess to try to keep your customers closer to you? Or you know, Adam made a really good point and I've, I've experienced this firsthand where you know, you've got your pre-approval pop pipeline and you call them every four or five weeks and um, and the finally, you know, Bob Jones would, would comes into the office and says, oh, Andrew, good news is I found a place on the weekend. You're like, oh, great. And then they go, yeah, I, I've got a loan at CBA because the branch is across the road. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> it's like, I was calling you every couple of weeks. Like, how did you? <laughs> and then you come in to break to me because you got excited. As in, um, but it's, you know, customers tend to make a decision based on whatever's in their head at the time when they're making that decision. And I think a lot of what we do, unfortunately, is guesswork, just trying to have a guess at when the customer might uh, be considering doing something. Um, what type of things, I guess, have you done or do you do, to, to I guess, to keep your customers close? Um, and, and, and I'm thinking, you know, including what you do with social media, email marketing, um, events, what, what type of things do you um, have you done? I've been at some of the events that you've run before, so... Yes, so I think I think with most things we've got to come at it from different angles because, like you said, sometimes you're kind of hoping that you're targeting them at the right time. Um, as humans, we do take the easiest approach, and I think one of the biggest challenges we all face is being front of mind. So you kind of you've got to, kind of got to come at it from a few different angles, and it doesn't actually the same method doesn't work for each client so as we go through and we set up our relationships with clients there's people that are going to be absolutely price driven and and price needs to be the main thing in that conversation but then there's people that are absolutely relationship based so they do want to talk to you about what little jimmy did on the weekend and you've got to try to remember what jimmy did and what his sport is and don't get that sport wrong because then you're going to lose that relationship with the client so It's really about making that connection in the beginning and understanding the client that you're working with and then making sure you're tailoring that approach to that specific client. So, um, you know, we have some, I have 
notes after appointments in terms of how I've connected with a person and, and what I think is going to be right. So I know whether whether that's going to be a bottle of alcohol that's going or whether it's going to be cupcakes. Um, one, of, one of the things that I implemented pretty early was to not do a settlement gift um, because at settlement I'm already front of mind. Um, on a purchase they've got a settlement gift from their conveyancer, they've got a settlement gift from their real estate agent, they've got their parents and their friends all giving them gifts. Mm. They've dealt with me so many times, so mm. I decided to move that budget to the first year anniversary because at one year I'm not front of mind. They haven't actually probably spoken to me for six months. And so what we started to do was send cupcakes or flowers or alcohol and very stereotypical to the female's workplace of the thing because then they go, oh, what have you got? And, in you know, it would be from their broker and there's the business cards in the office but then everybody's going, you know, because they think somebody's in trouble, so there's a gift <laughs> coming. <laughs> and then it's, oh, no, this is from my broker. So that's something that's worked really well. Um, and, and sorry, I should mention not, not at the 12-month mark because, like we've talked about earlier, we, you know, fixed rates. If you're contacting them as their fixed rate is expiring, you're too late because the bank's letter went out a month before that. So, you know, so we started to implement kind of, six weeks before and in the card that would go to the clients would be we'll be in touch in a few weeks to review your loan so I would never actually have to make that call because I would get the phone call from the client that day to say thank you I got this this is where we're at and this is what we're doing so I think those little things are really important um, and, and you mix that in with being on the front foot we just can't be reactive anymore. And, and that's where I think as brokers, we need to be really disciplined in how we manage our time because it's very easy to go, I've got all of this stuff in front of me that I need to process. Meanwhile, you've got stuff running out the back door. So it doesn't matter what you're putting in the front door. And that's where I think a simple thing like diary blocking and making sure that you're making those retention calls that you're on the front for is really crucial in this environment because there's too many options for people at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, spot on. I, I, just, I just want to point out, and it's just something I've experienced in, in coaching. If you're a broker and you're around that two, three year mark in, this is will quickly be, become your biggest bugbear as customers return for the secondary needs, whether it's a <laughs> rate increase, fixed rate expiry, they want to purchase a car. Um, what, what actually tends to happen to your business is the, you've kind of capped out of the number of transactions you can do and what. Um, and now you've got return to transactions coming to you. But these secondary needs don't generate as much revenue as a primary need or as a new customer. Um, and then all of a sudden you find yourself working as hard as you've ever worked in your life, but you're not making as much revenue month on month on month. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real catalyst point to, uh, to growth um, and, and how you need to grow from there is when you hit that point. Um, if, you're, if you're around two, three year mark, this is something you definitely need to be looking at. You need to pick up the phone, call they call your relationship manager at your aggregator or get in touch with the business coach or, or someone uh, and actually walk through some of these options. Um, it's, it's very, very important. Um, Andrew, uh, Andrew, yeah, sorry, sure. can I just uh, can I just add one thing? Because I think it's really important. So, um, and it follows on from uh, Jenna's comment about fixed rates. I mean, I think brokers need to be aware and planning for this, like this huge second wave of refinancing that's going to happen when all these customers come off these really low fixed rates, right? And so, I mean, now is the time, and I can't stress this enough, and I'm super passionate about broker retention, client retention, so you have to focus on it. Make sure that for the next 24 months, the next 36 months, you know exactly who's coming off their fixed rates. And what we see is that 90 days before that maturity day is the, is the optimum time to call out to that broker as a minimum. So don't leave it too late because they've already decided to do something. But if you're not, if you're not doing it, you're going to see an increase in those clients. Just They'll just leave your book. Like it's just going to happen. So there's a huge amount of clients that are coming off 1.69, 1.89, 1.99 1 fixed rates. And, and you need to be aware of that. Yeah, it, look, especially, and it's only going to get more and more prevalent uh, that if you're not communicating to your customers, someone else will be. 
Um, I, it's, it's I'm just a bit, bit tongue in cheek, but I, th I think it's a, it's a genuine issue within the industry. So I don't, don't have the exact solution to it yet, but as in, I, I've noticed um, as more and more brokers uh, take up active pipe, um, and what happens is you have a customer who's that they've spoken over the years to two, three, four, five different brokers. So they're on everybody's email um, list. And then all of a sudden something goes wrong and um, they send out multiple multiples of the same email. And you get the one customer, you get 15 emails exactly the same from five different brokers. Um, it, it's, yeah, that's the extreme version of it. But do you know that now, as in, I, I know um, as being a part of Nectar Group, Nectar Group, it's our point of difference um, four or five years ago was our automated marketing uh, where we would be you know, communicating to customers on your behalf, you know, 90 days out from fixed rate expiry, all those sorts of things. And it was it was a point of difference where now um, there's an option for everybody. And if, you, if you're not, if you don't have automated communications going out to your customers right now, um, I can tell you now your, your customer is receiving it from someone else. Um, guaranteed. Guaranteed. And um, it's it's a very competitive uh, space. Um, Jenna, what what advice would you give? Um, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe maybe it is a broker right now is feeling a little bit overwhelmed by everything that's going on, maybe a little bit apprehensive about where things are going um, with interest rates and their customers. Um, how, how do you find time to prioritize maintaining customers when Perhaps you might be a one-man band, and as we know, most most brokers are. Um, how do you find the time? How do you find the headspace to do that? I think it. I think it goes back to a point I touched on earlier around diary blocking. Uh, you know, especially especially in the one-man band phase of your career, it it was a game changer for me. Um, you know, really simple things like not allowing email pop-ups on my laptop because I do emails in a particular time and then I do loan processing in a particular time. I do relationship calls in that time and sticking to that um, because I think as brokers when we wear all the hats and we're a one-man band, we're doing one-tenth of a job but then we jump because we're going to answer the phone or, um, you know, and I think, I think another crucial part is setting expectations for your clients on when you're going to, when you're going to speak to them and sticking to that because that actually stops your phone ringing. Um, it stops you then being reactive to a call because you're giving them updates at timely timely intervals. That will be crucial to then being able to maintain your existing book because if you stick to your principles, you're going to be able to manage what's running out the back door. Um, one of the things for me when I was a young broker because I'm so old now, uh, more mature, more mature broker. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, I used to, uh, you know, I had a few back in the early days when I was taking leads where there was a lot of challenge around competing with other brokers that were offering, you know, annual package fees as a reimbursement to a client. And, you know, I, I'm seeing a little bit of it now where brokers are actually offering rebates for refis. Like actually brokers are doing it and giving some of their comms back. And it can be, it can be a bit daunting as a broker, but I think you just actually need to remember your value proposition. And having done it early, one thing I learned is that the customer that's going to challenge you with that at day one is actually going to challenge you with that at year one, year two, year three, year four. So whilst we might want to have clients in the door, we want the right clients so that we've got the time to focus our energy where we want to. Um, don't forget what your value add to the transaction is. And it's certainly not putting putting your own commission back in a client's pocket. It's putting money in their pocket through better rates um, just be really mindful of that because I think we'll probably see a little bit more conflict as people panic um, but as people panic it's going to drive more traffic like Adam mentioned we're going to have all of those fixed rates coming out um, there is going to be plenty of business for all of us we just need to be careful about what we're what we're managing and and put our time into the right activities 
Yeah, I never thought I'd say this. Well, first of all, I didn't, I didn't think we'd get to 70% market share, but I think in the current environment, we're only going to see that grow continually um, because it will be difficult, more difficult for, for consumers to get the right loan. Um, so, yeah, a, a, yeah, no, re really good, wise words, Jenna. And um, know your value proposition, I think, is a great way to make sure you retain the customer because if you don't understand your value, how, how are they going to understand your value? Uh, and really I think I think the I think the thing around the customer that challenges you on rebates and you know getting getting comms from you, the old birds of a feather flock together. They're the referrals you're going to get from those clients. And is that what you want your book to look like in five years? So you know, really take note. I think in this time of of who you have a good transaction with, and then make sure you're targeting those people for referrals from their friends because you know we tend good people mix with good people and idiots kind of tend to mix with idiots so you know just think about who you want to work with moving forward it is so true i, I, know, I know a particular broker who um had this nightmare customer absolute nightmare customer who he bent over backwards for finally appeased her um and then she referred a friend and he took the deal. <laughs> so it was the worst mistake he ever made. <laughs> yeah. it, it was just, yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't end well. But um, look, no, thank you so much, Jenna, I guess, for sharing some of your insights and your experience. Um, and I know that if uh, anyone does want to reach out to Jenna, she'd always be happy to have a, have a quick chat. Um, uh, she's always been quite generous with her time. Uh, so I do appreciate you sharing your experience. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, look, we, we, I'm going to, look, ben, Ben's on, on, on the line. Um, unfortunately, he's over in Canada right now, not, and he's a little bit unsure of his, his, his uh, internet connection. Um, but we did pre-record an interview with Ben. And I, I think this is, this is a, it was a fascinating conversation we had. We're talking about some of the things that we've already been talking about, but then also how technology, open banking, and a, and a few other things is going to, eventually take some of the guesswork out of what we're doing right now. So where, you know, rather than us randomly sending emails to customers, hoping that we may just contact them at the right time, um, actually being able to look at how technology can help us or notify us when it is the right time to contact, contact the customer. So I'm just going to, uh, just going to set that up right now.